Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Get, get, get that! Baltimore! What are they getting? Everything out of me. They gonna get a Super Bowl out of me. Need that. Need that. Welcome on back to another edition of the Baltimore Beatdown Podcast. It is Sunday night, January 8th, 2023. My name is Jake Luke, and I'm joined on my screen by Spencer Nathaniel Schultz. Rocking a, an interesting hat option here tonight. I like to like to keep it fresh. Ravens fall to the Bengals 27 to 16. A couple silly mistakes, but really a game where you feel like you can kind of hang your hat on the effort that the Ravens put forth and the way that they felt, especially in the second half, and uh, kind of just brushing aside a couple pretty stupid big mistakes that they made. Obviously a strip sack at the end of the first half that gifts the Bengals seven points and kind of prevents this one from being as close of a game as it probably would have been and felt like it was. So with that being said, the Ravens' defense puts forth a super valiant effort, felt like they were up to the task despite being down Brandon Stevens and Marcus Peters and a couple guys and some guys going in and out, but ultimately felt like, I don't know the, the essence, the Ravens are moving forward. They're going to be playing as the six seed against the Bengals as the three seed in the wild card round. We'll figure out which day of next week I would put my money on Saturday. Uh, eh, I'm going to, I'm going to put my money on Sunday. Actually. It feels you've been, like you've been the Saturday thing for a couple of weeks at this point. I feel like, yeah, I think, I think they're, they might throw this one on Sunday. I'm getting the, the vibes now. Thought that if it was a, an AFC South winner versus the Ravens, they might get this one out of the way. But I think there's a little spunk factor. And obviously the the huge question that now that it's the playoffs, the entire media storm is going to be circled around the Ravens. The, the vultures will be around the Ravens. And if Lamar Jackson is going to play or not, there have been several reports from Ian and other big wigs, big Jays in the conglomerate that, the Ravens are confident that Lamar Jackson will play. There is still some swelling. The injury is a hard one and one that it's like there's rumors that it's, or I guess not even rumors, there's reports that it can't get worse, but that it's still yeah, uncomfortable, whatever it is. So it feels like a brace situation. Lamar definitely not going to be 100%. And I think that's what we miss so often is that injuries, are you're not 100%. Arguably ever again, you just learn to uh, overcome it or adapt to it. And especially not during the same season. Like I think of a guy like Travis Jones, who hyperextended his knee and had a, a knee sprain effectively uh, at the very beginning of his rookie campaign, forced him to miss a couple games. A guy like Mark Andrews, you know, those players end up getting surgery in the offseason or end up having a cleanup or whatever in the offseason, or they have to rehab it pretty profusely. So that is what January football is about playing hurt, playing uh, when you're a little bit banged up. So, Jackson, it feels like, uh, is not going to miss this game. I just don't really think there's any way where he doesn't throw a brace on and go out there and, you know, God forbid, come out if he, it doesn't feel right and he can't do it. But um, I don't know. It feels like the Ravens are in a position where they built this team to play the Bengals. The Bengals built themselves to beat the Ravens after the Ravens are going 14-2 and two and 11-5 and five and Lamar Jackson's MVP. The AFC North looked at themselves and said, uh-oh, we have to construct defenses that can – limit this team from taking this division and running with it or, you know, and on an individual basis, Brown Steelers, Bengals. And then they go out, they get Jamar chase. They get have Joe Burrow. Obviously they have this explosive offense. So the Ravens countered by, all right, we're done with Wink Martindale. We're going to bring in a more too high prevalent uh, sim pressure, happy, but less blitz heavy defensive coordinator in Mike McDonald. That's going to shade receivers a little bit more. So that's going to limit the, the perimeter activity a little bit, encourage teams to have to throw over the middle. Then they go get Marcus Williams. They go get Kyle Hamilton. They end up getting Roquan Smith, all these pieces. The Ravens built themselves to play the Bengals. They made all of those moves this offseason for this game, basically. And this could have very well been a game where if one or two bounces throughout the season went a different way, that very well would have been for the division, would have been for a playoff spot, could have even been for, who knows, a, a top seed in the AFC. Uh, depending on how things 
could have gone just a little bit differently this season. So we get a small taste of that today and, and what that defensive effort was that felt pretty darn strong. Even guys like Worley making plays out there. David Ajabo goes and gets a nice sack and puts the Ravens uh, in a good position to, to make this game competitive again. So I'm fired up for this one. It's playoff football. This is what we've been waiting for. As a, as a football fan, this is what you wait for. If you're a Chiefs fan, if you're a Bills fan, if you're you know an Eagles fan this year, a Cowboys fan, you wait all year. You know you enjoy the wins as they come. Feels like the Ravens fan base probably didn't do a good enough job of enjoying wins. But at the end of the day, all of it's in the past. The injuries are all what they are, and you have to figure out a way to go be perfect, to go game plan, to go do what the Tennessee Titans did to the Jaguars and made them, you know, despite going on the road, but not having your starting quarterback, all of those things, it shows what you can do as a coaching staff and, and what the NFL really is, that the talent disparity is there, but it is not as severe as we make it out to be. The Titans gave the Jaguars with Josh Dobbs an absolute run for their money in a game that nobody gave them a, a really a sniff around to be in and were unanimously picked. They were, you know, five minutes away potentially from stoning the Jaguars offense. The Jags end up getting that strip sack, all of those things. So, you know, it truly is any given Sunday. Playoff games have had crazy things happen, uh, crazier than, than we can imagine. Even the, the Titans coming into Baltimore and beating them the way they did, or the Ravens beating the Denver Broncos in Denver when they had Peyton Manning, were the best team in the NFL. Anything can happen. I'm fired up for this one. I'm really excited. Yeah, me too. Any any given Sunday, and I mean, if Lamar comes back, and I do believe that he will, it feels like things are trending that way. I don't have any inside information. I'm just reading the tea leaves from Ian and people, uh, you know, that are kind of connected with the organization. And I I believe that he wants to be out there. I believe he has wanted to be out there. It's just tough. And like I think the goal ultimately was when this offense really started to leak oil after you lose Bateman. It's kind of like let's just let's keep the plane in the air, right? Let's just get to the runway. Let's just get back to let's just get back to England and let's land in the, let's land and just make it over the cliffs of Dover and just get into the field and just, you know, find whatever runway we can. And that can be your, your playoffs basically. And I think, uh, you know, to your point, they accomplished it and they had already accomplished that a couple weeks ago. So these last couple weeks, they had felt weird and really all it turned into was less about the results of these games and more about the health of Lamar Jackson. When he's going to, when is he going to come back? Is it going to be in one of these games and frustration really started to mount uh, because not only was it not, but we weren't getting a ton of uh, updates on that. Uh, since we last recorded, John Harbaugh has come out and uh, he ostensibly really apologized for like what his performance is at the, the podium a little bit. And uh, I think, you know, we had talked a little bit about before that happened about let's maybe and I was frustrated, too, but it's like, let's maybe take it easy on him here a little bit. He's in a tough spot, but that was nice to see him come out and say that it was nice to see the reporting that came out around Jackson status. I do think it sounds like he's gearing up to go and make this thing happen, whether he's going to have to wear a brace, whether he's going to be 80 percent, which seems to be the number that's going around. It seems like he is going to be out there and. I guess jumping into today's game, you already touched on it a little bit. We don't have to do a ton on it, but it does kind of feel like a game where, you know, maybe the, the Bengals, their foot wasn't all the way on the gas, but they also like they were uh, and <laughs> I was getting a little chippy on Twitter. They were making this into a, uh, a very much Cincinnati Bengals versus the world thing because they've just gotten so screwed in this whole DeMar Hamlin situation, which, uh, you know, that's an entire podcast unto itself. But they were kind of, you know, they, they were acting a fool today a little bit and uh they, they barely managed to beat this ravens team 27 to 16 uh you know anthony brown i thought he looked very solid he had some turnovers but like i also said on twitter they rather have a quarterback who's going to maybe have some turnover turnover potential but also move the ball a little bit i felt like that just wasn't there with huntley a lot of the time and uh you get get a couple of touchdowns out of it i believe and um or maybe it was just one but 16 points total and it could have been more were it not for uh, some head scratching uh, decisions, I think, down in the red zone that led to that uh, strip sack by Joseph Osai, or at least he scored the touchdown. Trey Hankerson, I believe, was the one that forced that. Uh, and yeah, it, it just felt like they were they were closer in this game than maybe the final scoreboard would have looked like. And that is a very encouraging sign to your point when you don't have Calais Campbell out there, when you don't really have Marcus Peters out there, when Lamar Jackson has missed yet another game. And is it all leading to a perfect storm where Lamar took plenty of time off? He got himself right mentally, if not physically, because things were looking a little bit rocky there even before he got hurt. Uh, you know, take some time off. Maybe that's just what the doctor ordered psychologically for him. And this offense is starting to look decent. Yeah, Charlie Kohler making a debut today, looking pretty good, uh, making a couple nice catches. Isaiah likely with a career high 100 uh, plus yard game. And I think he had a, uh, a touchdown as well. So, 
um, yeah, just overall a, a very solid effort by uh, by this group. And I think it's it's encouraging, if nothing else, going to this playoff game. I'm not expecting, you know, them to go out there and just or I'm not expecting the Bengals to go out there and play exactly like they did today. I think they'll tighten it up a little bit. I think the Ravens need to tighten it up a little bit. But to me, there's no reason why they can't make it a close game in Cincy once again next week. Kyle Hamilton, Roquan Smith and uh, Patrick Queen, some of the other off ball players looked mega physical and ready to run and roll and rip and confident what they're seeing underneath. I think that the Ravens had answers for what the Bengals were doing and empty a little bit. And again, what this Ravens defense is built and the ideas that they have against Cincinnati, we'll get deeper into this game. We'll go back and look at previous game. We'll probably have Mike Sanagato on, hopefully, who is our buddy who covers the Bengals, who's tweeted just now smoking a cigar and said back to back and just, he's been i gotta give him credit though he's been extremely level he's the least annoying Bengals fan by far yes. yeah we, we've got some other more high profile people in that fan base that have just really shown their ass this week and the, he's the Bengals themselves the, 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 the coin high. flip celebration and the, all of the antics today zach taylor screaming his head off for four quarters just the woe is me is is really sickening and i don't know in my in my almost 30 years here now on this earth that's not the way that the football gods reward you is is acting and bitching and moaning and crying um so i don't know i am a little bit i'm not a little bit i'm very sick of the bengals bitching about this entire you know, you know what i have to say to that life. i got a feeling their whole family's going down i don't know this, what that's from <laughs> come on man that's uh what is it billy madison o'doyle rules uh, okay, there we go. Well, I got a feeling your whole family's going down. I had, I actually, it's funny because I said this about the Bills, so the way they were acting when the Ravens played them. Obviously, that was going to be lifted, and the fatwa would be lifted in light of the Demar Hamlin situation. I am rooting for the Bills if the Ravens uh, don't make it past them. But uh, yeah, it's it has been thoroughly transferred over to the Cincinnati Bengals. You better keep your eyes on the road and both hands on that station wagon steering wheel because I got a bad, bad feeling for you, Cincinnati. It might not be next week but it might be the week after. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see what happens. That obviously covers a wide range of things, but uh, this is this is uncouth behavior, and I think that they're going to pay for it. I, I fully agree. I'm tired of the bitching and the moaning of, of what's happened and the coin flip and woe is me and the rules are the rules. And, yeah, that's that when the NFL designed their, uh, their little rules that covered cancellations of games where – oh, maybe there's a weather event that prevents a game from going on in, in week 14, or maybe there is some sort of geopolitical activity going on that you know changes things a little bit. No, man. They, it was a different, unprecedented situation. A player, a player, see, it sounds like he literally died on the field if he had to be resuscitated. Someone died on the football field momentarily. And then to not even five days later be going through the pissing and the moaning and the bitching that they have gone and, and run to the media with and the Joe Goodberries of the world. My God, man, just get a fucking grip, read the room. Just, it, I, I can understand thinking it. I can understand having the thought, Oh man, that sucks. Like, wow. What do we get out of this? But to just continuously bitch about it is just so classless and stupid and beneath what, the entire effort of the DeMar Hamlin thing is and you have to like, you have to tell yourself a story about why you're the underdog. The Kansas city chiefs have to tell themselves a story about why they're the underdog. The bills have to do the same thing. All these good teams have to do it. The Bengals have to do it. They have chosen to do it in a pretty fucking classless way. At least a lot of the fans are and the play and the coaches. It's, cheap. it's, it's, it's cheap. It's just cheap. And you know, it, it stinks like Kentucky gentlemen and you know, Paul malls. It, it's cheap. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, it, and like the Ra and like not for nothing, the Ravens literally lost the division. You can talk about the home field advantage and the coin flip. I get that. But they were the Ravens literally did not get a chance to win the division because of this. I don't fucking care. Like, you yeah, know, Joe Burrow's smoking cigars in the locker room wearing his Joe Cool sunglasses, which, and by the way, that guy like. You know, good dude, like awesome player. I'm getting a little sick of it. Like it just, I, I, the whole thing, it's just too much for me. Like, let's calm down with all this. I, that, that's what the irony of it for me is that they have been gifted through sucking a very dynamic quarterback and an awesome wide receiver. And they end up getting one of McVay's guys that looks like, hey, he puts them in a competitive position. Can't you just shut the fuck up and enjoy like the division that you were gifted and enjoy that you made the playoffs for the second straight season after in the gutter 
for years, you finally got it right. You finally have someone better than Andy Dalton or any of the other quarterbacks that you have, and you're still just finding a reason. And that it, again, that's why, and we do a lot of pissing and moaning ourselves about Ravens fans and what they piss and moan about, but it just goes to show no one in today's society or as a fan or whatever you want to call it can just enjoy pleasantries, can just enjoy life. Can't you just enjoy that you have Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and you made the playoffs and won the division? No, you have to find something to get pissed off in high frequency about all the time. It is draining. It is exhausting. It is bad for your mental health. And stop. Like, smell the fucking roses for once, you stupid fan base. You stumble last year into the playoffs. You get to play Ryan Tannehill and Derek Carr. You're facing death against both of them late in the fourth quarter. People seem to forget. Ryan Tannehill throws an interception. Titans have the ball on their own 40-yard line with a minute left. Yeah, they, were, a- they were literally, like, they were on the doorstep. Like It's Nick Westbrook Okine in his hands, tips up in the air. Logan Wilson gets the interception. Your rookie kicker hits a 52-yard field goal to win that game in regulation for you. Then they end up making four stops. It might have been three stops after a spike against the Raiders. These might have been in the opposite order. It was Raiders first, then Titans. You make four stops in a row against the Derek Carr Raiders. So you end up squeaking by. Derek Carr and Ryan Tannehill, the two most unimpressive quarterbacks that will probably play in the AFC playoffs in the last two years, save maybe Ben Roethlisberger, and then you go beat Kansas City, you get to go play in a Super Bowl. Fast forward, you are complaining about a fucking seed because someone because someone literally momentarily died on a football field. So there's there's my fuck you to Bengals fans that are being so classless. Not Mike Sanagato, we hope to have, but as you said, has had perspective. That's why we like having him on our show, and we'll look to have him on again. But I'm, I'm just done with the Bengals, man. I'm done with that fan base. I'm done with the team. I'm done with the bitching and the moaning. I'm not even just done with the Bengals. I'm done with everyone's bitching and moaning. This is playoff football. It is January football. This is the best of the best. This is the best time of the year, and we're finding reasons to be unhappy. Yeah, I, I, you know, go off, King. I'm right there with you. Um, I've definitely fallen into the vortex of negativity a little bit, too, because frankly, and to open a vein a little bit, I think this is what it is for a lot of people, uncertainty about Lamar Jackson's future. And that's tough. I mean, that's a tough thing to square with. And uh, but ultimately, I, I need to I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm projecting that onto this season. And uh, maybe that's not fair if he's going to be coming back and playing in this game in particular. And that's what has me fired up for you know maybe he does leave maybe this is it but if i get to watch him play one more game in this uniform in the playoffs and maybe uh maybe right some wrongs and you know maybe not even do that but uh hopefully just go out there and give it his all he he has been a absolute joy to watch in this uniform and uh you know if he if he manages to get back out there i will feel very blessed for it and uh i think he'll We'll go out there and uh, make it a game, just like they really did today in his absence. I think uh, things are setting up pretty well for maybe a little bit of a redemption arc. So wouldn't that be fun? It would be unlikely. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I'm feeling a lot better than I was even just a week ago at this point. Definitely. It's exciting. It's scintillating. It is playoff football. It is the time for the the one game that defines everything over and over again. And. You said something unlikely. Well, Isaiah likely goes for 100 yards today. Feels like he has become. He didn't a have a touchdown either. I said that earlier. That was that was stupid. He had a touchdown last week though, and yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people saying, you know, why why not get him the football? I think he ends up finishing second in second or third in yards, targets, touchdowns, first downs among rookie tight ends this year. Had a really nice season for a fourth round pick, and has started to really uh, peak and. For each form late in season here. So him, Andrews, the Ravens end up waving Deshaun Watt, Jackson, pardon me, who has gone on and said, like, I, I ain't playing no politics or something. Very confusing move. Don't, don't really know about that one very much. Um, yeah, that seemed so like uh, the Ravens and Deshaun Jackson this season. That I just feel, what, what are the, it's like the Tony Soprano, like it only ends two two ways for a guy like me. Like it, it just didn't seem like things were, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to like speak too bad about Deshaun or anything, but just with the way that this offense was set up, I just always felt that that, that was ripe to not end great. I don't even. I, who knows what's going on there? I don't. I don't understand that move. A little bit head head spinning, but Sammy though made a couple big plays in the passing game. Today. Yeah, Sammy was getting really physical downfield. Looks to be in the tune of the Sammy Watkins that does good things on a football field the last two weeks, and I uh, was able to create that little separation late. Ends up getting stripped, of course, just. Taking them while they're down a little bit after a, a really dynamic play he makes. Yeah, that's tough. Uh, I mean, Tylen Wallace making a catch, Prochet. 
<laughs> somehow turning like the best. I don't, I don't understand how James Prochet is on like that's at this point like how is James Prochet on the team and Deshaun Jackson's not? I don't. Yeah, that's, that's the guy. Just it's he's he's bad luck Brian from 2014. Like whatever the guy can do wrong, he does wrong. The biggest play of his career that puts the Ravens in position to be in this football game, to go make a run, to feel great about themselves offensively, and he fucking steps out of bounds unabated. I, I don't I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about that one. That one really, like, I laughed, genuinely, heartily laughed when that happened, and I don't know what to say about him. The the padding the ball, like, he is going down in history as, like, the – like, there was, a, there was Chris Moore, who also stepped out of bounds at one point at the end of his tenure in Baltimore – Yep. But what James Prochet is doing is just reaching a new peak of I'm not sure how you can be so bad situationally or whatever. The interceptions, the holding calls, the you know, whatever is going on with him. Just nothing the man can do. I, I feel for him a little bit, but I do, too. I mean, like, him. I really do. It's It sucks. Like, he's a guy that has probably had to really fight against it. Um even probably since he was in college, because he's you know maybe a little little bit undersized compared to some guys. But my God, he is the Michelangelo of fucking up. Like what? what is the true detective line: "You are the Michael Jordan of being a son of a bitch." Like the James Prochet is the Picasso of just like <laughs> just completely stupid shit. Like happening on a football field. Some of it his fault, some of it not. But he is just he is bad luck, Brian. Like I, I said, he was Bitcoin today of wide receivers. Like. It's just a tough scene right now. All hype and nothing but crashing and burning. Yeah. Um, and and I, you see things like you see him create separation at times, all those things, whatever. But it is just it's out of hand. So those two plays c- paired up with Demarcus Robinson starting to get involved, feel himself a little bit, does the little cross to God, you know, caught the ball. And for all intents and purposes, I honestly do think that was a catch. He had the ball. The ball goes to the ground. He still has the ball, whatever. I don't care that much. It wasn't that big of a call. Wasn't worth challenging. Don't know why John did that. Anyway, then he ends up just dropping five consecutive passes at the end of the game there. So it's like when they're doing good things, they're somehow still doing bad things. Sammy Watkins shoves a dude out of the way, catches a ball, runs for 20 yards after the catch, gets physical, and they rip the ball loose and turn the ball over to end the game effectively. James Prochet, oh, he makes a dynamic play after the catch. Looks really calm in space, shakes one guy, rattles his way down to the five yard line, and he was out of bounds 35 yards before before he touched the ball. So it's uh it, it just is what it is. The Ravens receiving room is unlucky, is beyond unlucky. There is an evil spirit inside of it. It truly is the Ted Lasso trainer's room in the wide receiver room. And again, I'm just gonna say next year, if you put Anquan Bolden in the ring of honor. Rashad Bateman's foot will probably heal. Whatever third round receiver you draft will probably turn into a really good wide receiver too. And you'll end up having the Justin Jefferson, Andre Johnson, Steve Smith, Jamar Chase, you know, receiver that you've always wanted at some point in the near future. Something, something has to be done spiritually. It's interesting you say that because like we did get the him retiring with the team and like they, I think they actually did like a ceremony for him too uh, in 2019. Um, Cause I remember I was at purple patio and like, he. <laughs> just getting shit faced like and that was like the most fun season ever like he he just appears on the screen out of nowhere and he's like I, i'm retiring as a baltimore raven it's like oh cool anquan like that's awesome yeah october 13th 2019 he retired as a raven and uh for someone that's like 11th and 12th or whatever he is in yards and catches if he wants to retire with you and ernest biner is in your ring of honor then maybe you want to throw anquan bolden in there Poor Ernest. I like, and I do this a lot too, but just absolutely just takes them from the cheap seats. Like whenever the ring of honor comes I mean, up. even like P like Peter Bowler, like what Peter sure. Bowler's with the Ravens a little longer. He's a very good player, but like, let's, let's fucking put in Quan Bolden in the ring of honor. You don't win a Super Bowl without him. He was your, your alpha offensively in that playoff run and was dunking on people left and right. I mean, what did he score a touchdown in three of those four games? Four, four touchdowns. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to if you want to stop having these James Prochet running out of bounds plays and this weird voodoo hex of dark clouds and evil spirits, then put in Quan Bolden in the ring of honor. It is time. It is finally time. But um, I guess getting back to this game, Anthony Brown, like you said, um, stupid interception he threw, but it's not like Tyler Huntley didn't do the same thing in a more high leverage situation at the end of the game last week. 
Uh, the strip sack, you know, probably want to have some sort of awareness of like, hey, ball protection or go down or get the ball out or throw the ball away or something, even if you don't want to be throwing it there, which I, I understand absolutely not wanting to, uh, and then kind of just punting back to the Bengals. Sure, your defense is playing well, but I thought ripped the ball decently well and got guys in rhythm. Charlie Kohler goes and makes a few catches. Um, you know, looked looked all right. Kenyon Drake starts dropping the ball late, sure, but they were in a rhythm. Threw for 286 yards in this one, 44 pass attempts. But I don't know. It was uh, it was moving the football. It was getting Isaiah Likely involved. It was looking somewhat competent at times, aside from the the goofy Looney Tunes shit that goes on with the receivers. But it's uh, I don't know what Isaiah Likely did. Having Charlie Kohler maybe able to go play a, a little bit of a role for you. Mark Andrews yeah. coming back. Maybe Sammy Watkins, Marcus Robinson can make like four plays next week. I think you've got a good shot to go beat the Bengals. Yeah, definitely. Going to need to force turnovers on defense, um, I think, to win that game. Uh, I mean, we'll obviously get into it, but that's why you that's why you sign a Marcus Williams. That's why you get all these guys on defense to uh, to make some plays for you. They're going to need to do that next week. They can't. Roquan Ro- Ro- uh, Smith, I mean, he, him and Kyle Hamilton really today were just – and Chuck Clark bullying the Bengals, ball carriers and ending plays and running through screens, all of those kinds of things. So. Yeah. Yeah, Williams had a nice uh, run down on a screen kind of late in the game, too, which was really awesome. I think, I think it was a Joe Mixon run. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all those guys, they looked really good. I think next step is next week, get your hands on a football. Like, however you do it, figure out a way. Bring down Joe Burrow, too. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of sack discourse that I think we uh, we engaged in a little bit um, in the group chat. Uh, a lot of them on the TL today, too, about he's squirrely, uh, man. And it's like what he what he was doing, those little loop rounds. The Ravens, when they are at their worst, don't contain quarterbacks. When they let Josh Allen come from behind or they let Tua start to come back a little bit, like keep, rush through contain, rush through keeping a quarterback in the pocket. That's how you end up with an Ojabo strip sack, because there was some level of him needing to step through in order to roll out as opposed to just running back around and looping and getting full field vision again, collecting themselves as a thrower. Kenny Pickett beat them seven times last week because they didn't contain him. You have a better shot to go hit the quarterback, go make the quarterback feel your presence if you rush through contain a little bit more. So I think that's going to be a major key next week. Yeah, definitely. Um, And just by hook or by crook, do what you got to do. Fucking bring him down. Like we can talk about all the technicals and all all that stuff that you mentioned is great, but – they, they're going to be without Collins, and it looks like Kappa. Kappa is on a uh, – It looks like a, a bad injury, shooter. yeah. So they are without their right side of their offensive line, which is their revamp side of their offensive line that was their bad side of their offensive line that they had to go out in the offseason and spend a bunch on Collins and Kappa. So they are going to be without both of those guys. I, I, I don't know, man. I, I like the way the Ravens match up against this team. Obviously, you have to be able to score points and move the football and not turn the ball over, but – Marlon Humphrey, Jamar Chase, like it feels like if the Ravens can prevent the monster play from happening, they have a very good shot to win. If if it's that Jamar Chase is beating you on like 16 yard back shoulders that are perfectly thrown and that kind of stuff, you can live with that. But if they can just limit big plays, man, that's that's really all it's going to come down to. Yeah, and it sounds very sports talk radio on my part to say, you know, get a couple sacks and, you know, turn the ball over. But like. You know, all that that's really all it's going to take. That's the next step for this defense. They look good otherwise that they they got put in some tough spots today. But overall, I mean, but Daryl Worley, he gave up a touchdown, but he also made a couple nice plays. That was good to see. Yeah, just get your hands on the football and splash plays in the backfield, you know, TFLs and sack Joe Burrow. Uh, and then that's going to set up your offense to do really well. And I think offense, like you mentioned, um, like the shovel passes to Mark Andrews, like get Mark Andrews involved. Look, do a little bit of the stuff that you were doing in that first month of the season. Quick game, just kind of getting guys into a rhythm, get Lamar into a rhythm, just let him set his feet and just kind of rip it to a guy in space and hopefully he makes a All-time play. All-time quote today as well, J.K. Dobbins obviously going to be super fresh, feeling confident and fresh, but I think the sidelines reporter, whichever one it was, is escaping me said that the surgeon who did J.K. Dobbins' operation oh, God, that was broke crazy. her tool on his scar tissue because it was so much and it was so thick. So I, I don't know what – J.K. Dobbins is the definition of that that wolf blood, that wolverine blood, but my God, man. He really – like he's – he's looked so good when he's been on the field and like, he's been battling injuries. And like, to that point, like you get, you get a scalpel stuck in your scar tissue. Like that sounds broken, broke off, broke off a tool inside his scar tissue. 
Yeah, that is disgusting. But I mean, that that also lends like credence to his leg just looking like a skyscraper when he's like running on these like long runs. Like it's like the fucking like the Chrysler Tower on one side of his hip, and then the other one is like a fully flexion like functioning leg. It just it's been incredible to watch, and he has been like he's brought the toughness. He has brought that sort of after action ability where you take that first contact then you bounce off and then kind of keep a full head of steam and keep moving forward. Like running backs matter, man, at least to an extent. And that guy is a, uh, a perfect example of it. So he's going to be big uh, in that game as well. Most certainly. So it's time, man. Mark Andrews is cooking. JK Dobbins is cooking. It's just going to be endless Lamar discourse until uh, I guess until what Tuesday when uh, he practices or he doesn't. So it is stay in Cincinnati. What do you think about that? I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I don't think they're going to run off Skyline Chili and late 90s architectural vibes, but mm. they can try. Okay. Well, uh, anything else on this one? And then I guess this sort of doubled as a little bit of a mini preview for the next uh, next one, but we'll obviously have more on that coming up in the week. But uh, anything else uh, from you tonight? Just fucking be a professional offense in any capacity. Sure. And this defense, I think, is ready. I think this defense is up to the challenge. I don't think that means they're going to go hold the Bengals to, you know, nine or 13 points or something. But I think that they can put you in a position to win. And there's a time for this defense to be great and go make a true impact play. Go steal a touchdown, pick, fumble, strip sack, something. It's time, man. It's time. This is this is all the marbles. And. You know, can this Ravens team make a run? We'll get into it further. No is going to be the answer, but go win one game, man. Go beat a divisional team that you know you can beat and you already have beat and you just played a super physical game against. I'm fired up for this one. I'm excited to break it down later this week. Like we said, we'll try and have uh, Mike or someone else from the Bengals community on to, to share their perspective and thoughts and all that good stuff. But I'm excited. Playoff football. This is this is the week. Yeah, it certainly is. And it feels like really the perfect matchup for this team. Um, it, you know, going back the last couple of years, it feels like these have been the two teams in this division uh, with the most kind of sand, with the most cachet. And they've uh, they've certainly had their run ins on the field. And it kind of feels like it's maybe all been heading towards this, maybe similar to the Ravens with the Titans back in 2019 and 2020. And I don't know how like public this is, I, but I think we heard through a little birdie that Lamar Jackson maybe gave a speech ahead of that Titans game in 2020 uh, talking about. Um, what was on the line uh, pride wise for them, not even just like, Hey, let's go win a playoff game and get the monkey offer back. It's like, let's, let's, let's give these fuckers a little bit of a taste of their own medicine here. I, I would like to maybe after the fact, hear something like that after a, uh, a real big win in Cincinnati with him returning, it would just be the perfect story. And uh, you know what? It's been a tough year. Let's give us that at least one, you know, maybe knock him out in the divisional round, maybe the AFC championship, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's give us one here this week. Football gods. I am praying to you to put these Bengals in their place. But we'll certainly see. Thank you guys for listening uh, to this recap. Like we said, going into it, not a whole lot to really say about this game. I think it was a better game than either of us were really expecting. Scoreboard not super close, but uh, they made it look close at times, and uh, if they could have gotten out of their own way, maybe we would be recapping a successful coin flip here. I mean, the, you know, the way things break in life sometimes, it's crazy. Uh, I talk about, you know, shout out to Harvey Dent and all the boys. But other than that... Uh, Solid week. Ravens finished the regular season 10 and 7. I think you would probably mark that as maybe a little bit of a disappointment. But uh, overall, I mean, it worked out as a, a pretty successful regular season in my book uh, when you make the playoffs in a tough division like this. So that's what it is. We'll have plenty more uh, in the coming week about this uh, upcoming game. We'll try to get Mike on, like he said. Thank you guys for listening. It's been a very fun regular season. And thank Christ it is not over like it was this time last year uh, when the Ravens crashed out of the playoffs. So uh, let's all remind ourselves that that's a very good thing. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on social media at Podcast Beatdown. You can find me at Jake Luke. That's L-O-U-Q-U-E. Spencer is at Ravens 4 Dummies. That is the number four in the middle. Playoffs are here, baby. Get some. See you. A reproduction. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Everything out of me. They gonna get a Super Bowl out of me. Need that. Need that.